Eat them all, eat them all. The blind the name the play the, the passes, the sick in body and the weak in mind. Whoever came, no matter how afflicted, we are sure is suffering remedy to him. His word gives aid, his touch restores the vigor to every weary pain, a sustained frame. And all he asked before he gave the blessing was simple faith in him from those who came. And it's our Lord, the kind, the good, the tender, less loving now than in those days of old. Or is it that our faith is growing feeble and Christian energy is waxing cold? Why do we not with equal expectation now bring our sick one to the Lord in prayer, right through the trunk of unbelieving scrub, up to his very side and leave them there? He never yet reviews in bygone age. No fear to take the chastisement away, then why not ask it now instead of praying for patience to endure for day to day? GHS 103 I welcome every one of us to today's Bible study and I pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ God is going to speak to every one of us in Jesus name. We have no any other announcement just to remind us that uh, every Monday we have our Bible study like this from 6.50 to 8.30 except the, we have a longer message from GS and then we have our Thursday prayer meeting every Thursday from Six o'clock to seven. I mean seven o o p.m. to. Se I mean from six to p.m. to seven o o p.m. And I pray as we are joining God, we continue to help us in Jesus' name. Let us do all what we can do to invite other people, and let us continue to endeavor to do. What I want you to know that our activities, our encouragement, are helping those people. 
that if these people can be doing this, why about me? And I pray that the grace of the Lord will reward every one of us according to the work of our hand in Jesus' name. I want to encourage us uh, that was the Sunday service on Sunday. Uh, that that one start by six. I mean, eight fifty to eleven thirty. And do not let us forget that the Ask Fellowship will be the last. Will be the last month, last Sunday of the month. Why we do evangelism? The Ask Coordinator should be thinking of where we are going now. And I pray that Almighty God is going to help us in Jesus' name. Let us keep remember all those people who are member who are not coming. If just a test message, let's send test message to them that we are going to Bible study now. And Almighty God is going to touch everybody's mind in Jesus' name. As we are taking circular work serious, we are going to be taking it serious in Jesus' name. How many of us able to say hello to Pastor Dada as I said yesterday? No, but let us try it. It's our Father in the Lord. Let us try it. I, I did. And then I can with me did. I don't know about my wife. I don't know about Brother Benjamin. I don't know about the Lava family boss. Let us try when something comes on the front. The people like that, the importance of leaders. And for almost two months, we have not heard from him. It's not too bad to say uh, that day. I just want to say hello. And then we will see how it's going to be happy. You know, it will be a surprise, but it will be less, less, less expected. That's why I said the Almighty God is going to reward every one of us in Jesus' name. Especially now that uh, we, they are counting it against us in Charlotte Way that we have not been involved in all headquarters program. And I cannot do it alone. The grace of the Lord will continue to be with every one of us in Jesus' name. If there's any other announcement, uh, we let us know. We let us bring our Titan offering. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our mighty Father, we glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, because you are King of Kings. Thank you, Lord, because you are Lord of Lords. We thank you, Lord, because it tattoo you have helped us. Out of what you are giving to us, we bring this little token. Father, bless it abundantly in Jesus' name. And let your name be glorified. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord and answer prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you're putting that the offering, continue to call upon the name of the Lord. That Father, touch me. Let your grace be sufficient for me. Let your mighty hand touch me. Call upon him. He's Lord of Lord, King of King. He knows in and out of our life. And he knows the end to the beginning. Surely, he will not disappoint us. No matter what the case may be, he's our father. If our earthly father can have mercy upon us, think about him. He is gracious. His name is God. His name is Lord. His name is Messiah. His name is omnipotent. His name is omniscience. This is he is Messiah. The son, of, the, the son of David, the one that can never change. The one that open and nobody can close. The one that close and nobody can open. Call upon him. Call upon him. He is God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. We shall listen to Bible reading, First King, chapter five. First King, chapter five. king of Tyre sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, 
Thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil a current. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. Now therefore, command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants, according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Zidonians. And it came to pass, when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given unto David a wise son over this great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the thing which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of fir. My servant shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea in floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me, and will cause them to be discharged there, and thou shalt receive them and thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Hiram year by year. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they two made a league together. And King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel, and the levy was 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by courses. A month they were in Lebanon, and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the levy. And Solomon had threescore and 10,000 that bear burdens, and fourscore thousand hewers in the mountains, beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, 3,000 and 300, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them, and the stone squares. So they prepared timber and stones to build the house. May God bless his word and our heart in Jesus' name. We shall listen to the choir song. Yeah. 
and resurrection I will never be the same again I said I will never be the same again the Lord bless you and your families Father we thank you tonight we bless your name we thank you for the Bible study we're asking Lord that you bless all your people inside outside everywhere bless us in Jesus name revive us to revive others Touch our lives to touch others. And move us on so we can move other people on. Upward and forward. Help us to keep on moving in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Break every yoke. Destroy the works of the devil. That the joy of the Lord be the strength of your people. I pray that tonight there will be no exception. You will bless everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can be seated. We're coming to John chapter 5. As we come to John chapter 5, we we'll see something spectacular, something very special, something very different you don't find in any of the other Gospels. As you look at the Gospel according to St. John, he recorded some miracles. And these miracles he recorded were peculiar to him he had you know that matthew mark and luke had written their gospels before him and he didn't bother to repeat uh, many of the miracles that those uh, evangelists recorded but now you look at john and you're going to find turning water into wine that's only found in john and you find the miracle we're reading about today this is only found in john and the question is how is it that he recorded only these few, few miracles. Is it because he believed that Jesus did only these few? No, not at all. Actually, Jesus did uh, many miracles, but these ones were specially selected. And the one we're looking at tonight is going to be a blessing to your soul. We're looking at John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind of halt and with uh, withered, uh, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Eventually, the man got healed. Like eventually, you are going to get healed. Yeah. As I said, many miracles were done by the Lord Jesus Christ, which are not recorded by John directly or specifically. But the recorded ones were purposefully selected. And let's just show that uh, John knew 
that Jesus performed many miracles. And he didn't bother to specify them or record them one by one. We're looking at John chapter 2, verse 23. John chapter 2, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Miracles in the plural. Actually, he performed many miracles and John noticed that. Look at chapter 3 and we're coming to verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles in the plural that thou doest except God be with him. So you see the acknowledgement that actually he performed many, many miracles. Chapter, chapter 6, we're looking at verse 2. In chapter 6, verse 2, again the acknowledgement that he performed many miracles, it says, and the great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, plural, which he did on them that were diseased. We'll come to chapter 7 and verse 31. Chapter 7 Verse 31, talking about the many miracles, verse 31 says, And many of the people believed on him, and said, When, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? And then we come to chapter 11, verse 47. Chapter 11, verse 47 it says in verse 47, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth, tell me, many miracles. So John is telling us, don't be limited to the miracles I've recorded here. These ones were chosen specially, but actually Jesus did many miracles of Verse 48, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. We come to chapter 12, verse 37. Chapter 12, verse 37, but though he had done, what does it say, so many miracles you know as john has been writing he spoke about miracles plural he spoke about many miracles and now he says so many miracles uh, before them yet they believed not on him and he goes on to say now in uh, chapter 20 verses uh, 30 and 31 john chapter 20 I was reading from verses uh, 30 and 31, uh, where John himself confirms that the miracles of Jesus Christ were not limited to these ones we're reading in the Gospel according to St. John. Verse 30, and many other signs, many other wonders, many other miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. It's saying that you see the other miracles, you see many of the others in Matthew, they are not written here. You see many of them in Mark, they are not written here. You see many of them in, 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 um, in Luke, and they are not written here. Many other signs, many other miracles truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in, the, in this book. Look at verse 31. But these are written. The special ones here are written. The chosen ones they are written, the selected ones in John they are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And the same thing with the miracle we're looking at today, the healing of the impotent. This one was recorded. Why? Number one, to reveal Christ as the expected Messiah. Because he did things that no other person had done. And you will see that this is not just a prophet. This is not just a teacher. This is not just a rabbi. It's not just a master. This is Christ himself. And John is recording this to say, have you seen any kind of miracle like this any other place of the, in the Bible? Have you seen this with Moses? Have you seen this with Elijah? Have you seen this with any other prophet? 
Here is the Christ, the Messiah. Number two, it is to show that Christ is greater than the angels. As we look at the miracle here today, an angel will come and trouble the water. And then the lucky person that comes in the first time will be healed. But Jesus Christ didn't have to use water. He didn't have to trouble the water. As he came, he just told the man, rise up and he rose up. And John is saying, this is the Messiah. Number two, is greater than the angels. Number three, is showing that this one that has come is greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, and greater than all the prophets of the Old Testament. He says, as you look at the ministry of the Old Testament, prophets, you will not find anything near this one that those people did. Here is somebody higher. Here is somebody greater than Moses or Elijah or Abraham or any of the people in the Old Testament. Number four is to show the blindness of Israel. The blindness of Israel that even the common people said when that Christ comes, Will he do more miracles than this? And yet the chief priests and the leaders of the land, they were blind. They couldn't see that this is the Christ. Number five, it is to show the deadening effect of ineffective abolished religion. Because they held on to the religion of the old covenant, the Sabbath and the ceremonies and all the other things, it blindfolded them. And John is saying, if anybody can see this and not believe in Christ, he must have been deadened by religion. Number six is to show how the fear of traditional authority can keep many from the faith and from heaven. In chapter 9, Jesus opened the eyes of the man that was born blind. And the Pharisees said they didn't want to accept. They knew it happened. They didn't want to accept. And so they called the parents and they said, is this your son? They said, yes. And then was we'll he born blind? Yes, we're born blind. How were, how were the eyes open? They said, we don't know. But they knew. But they said this, they said, for the fear of of the Jews. That means that John is telling us that these miracles are real, but the miracles are to show how the fear of traditional authority of a people in authority can keep a man from faith and keep a man from heaven. But number seven, it is to convince and to convict and to compel sinners to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That's why he said many other signs were written, many other signs were done by the Lord Jesus Christ not reaching in this book but these are reaching that she may believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you will have life eternal thank God we have those who believe here tonight and as you believe eternal life will come to you in Jesus name we're coming back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 is what we're looking at today in John chapter 5 we see the Healing of the impotent. That's the topic tonight. The healing of the impotent. And we're dividing the passage to three parts. Number one, the previous provision for the impotent multitude. Impotent multitude. Multitudes of people there. So they were blind, they were hot, and they, they were halting, and they were withered, and they were sick in various ways. They were impotent. And it was a a, a kind of a previous provision for those impotent in the multitude. Point number two, the present possibilities of, in, of uh, incredible miracles. The present possibilities of incredible miracles. The present possibilities as Christ came. The past was to be forgotten. And the previous provision was uh, not necessary anymore. But Christ has now come. And it gives us the present possibilities of the supernatural, incredible miracles. Point number three, the persevering pursuit of an imperative mandate. The persevering pursuit of an imperative mandate. Through it all, Christ continued. Because he continued to persevere and to pursue the mandate the Father had given unto him. And the disciples too, with all the vicissitudes and all the challenges of the Pharisees, they continued the persevering pursuit of the imperative mandate. And then the man that was healed, 
the Lord gave him a command, a mandate, an order. He says, this is what you do from now on. And you find the persevering pursuit of the imperative mandate. Number one. What's number one over there? The previous provision for the impotent multitude. We're coming to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, uh, when G and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. What does that mean? After this, after this, you'll find that uh, John, as he arrives, he times everything. This happened after that, this happened after that, this happened. It's talking about the time that Jesus Christ has gone into Galilee. He came out of, and then he came into Galilee. And in that uh, Galilee, there was a noble man that saw him and said, Please help me. My son is at the point of death. And Jesus said, Thy son, tell me, live it. Thy son, live it. And then he discovered what Jesus Christ had said actually was fulfilled. And he knew that it was at that same hour that Jesus had said, Thy son, live it, that the fever left him. And then Jesus, we are now told that after that, after that event, after that miracle, after that healing, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You see, Jesus, says when he came, he was uh, obedient to the Old Covenant, Old Testament, because he was to abolish that. He was to bring an end to that. And so, as the, the Old Testament has said, that they will go to Jerusalem, the place where God had chosen, he also went. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. They were to be there at the time of the Passover. They were to be there at the time of Pentecost, they were to be there at the time of the feast, and when that time came, Jesus observed that of them. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, three times in a year, shall all thy females appear before the Lord thy God, and in the place in the which he shall choose in the feast of the unleavened bread, in the feast of the weeks, that's the Pentecost, and in the feast of a tabernacle, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. And because of that, Jesus now went after he had performed the miracle in uh, Capernaum. He now went to Jerusalem. We're coming to John chapter 5, verse 2. Now, there was a, 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 a there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. What that means, Bethesda is mercy. That is, God provided something for them before Jesus Christ came. There are many of them that were lame and that were blind, that were halting and that were withered. And because of that, God provided this. But he didn't understand. It was a temporary thing. That's why this section, I'm dividing into three parts. Number one, a past passing pool for healing. A past passing pool for healing. It was not something that was permanent because after Jesus Christ came there, after that, the pool was not operative anymore. After that, you're not going to find any record that angels were coming anymore. Angels came before Christ came. The prophets came before Christ came. The Lord giver came before Christ came. All those people came to help them one way or the other before Jesus came. But after he came, Moses, not necessary anymore. After he came, Elijah, Elisha, not necessary anymore. After he came, the angels, not necessary anymore. And the people did not understand that. Because after Jesus came, you'll see, after Jesus healed this man, the people were still looking at the pool. They didn't know that that pool is not going to work anymore now because the final solution has come. And the highest solution has come. And the mighty power of God has now come through Jesus Christ. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. We're reading from verse 9. The, the prophet spoke about that ahead of time. Isaiah chapter, chapter 22, verse 9. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many, 
and ye gathered together by the water, ye gathered together the waters of the lower, tell me the word, pool. That's it right there. It was prophesied that they will gather around that pool. Look at verse 11. He made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But ye have not looked unto the maker thereof. When Jesus Christ came, you know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In him was light, and the light of all men, and by him all things were made. That's the maker, that's the creator, and without him was nothing made that was made. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and full of truth but they were not looking at him they were looking at the pool that's why it says in that verse 11 it says but she had not looked unto the maker thereof neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago look at something now in verse 21 of that same chapter and I will close him, referring to the Messiah, referring to the Christ that will come, referring to the anointed one. That is, all these people were the pool, and eventually Christ will come. And he'll come with power. He'll come with authority. He'll come with anointing. He'll come with the miracle walking power that breaks every yoke and destroys every work of the devil. It says in verse 21, and I will clothe him with thy robe. And strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy, thy government into his hand. He's going to be the overall authority, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Verse 22 And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so that he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. Verse 9, we'll read about the pool. That's verse 9, Isaiah chapter 22. But that one is occasional. That one was the periodic. And that one was of the past. That one is going to pass away. It's going to be abolished. But the one that has the final key of authority, once it comes, then you look up to him. And let us come to uh, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we're looking at verse 3. In this lay a great multitude, of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Uh, this section I call a pitiable picture of helplessness. A pitiable picture of helplessness. Look at them. They couldn't help themselves. And all they could do was just to wait and to wait. And as they were waiting, Christ came. And as we are waiting tonight, Christ has come. It will touch your life. It will transform your soul. You'll never be the same anymore in Jesus' name. But you know, if they were reading their, you know, their scriptures, they would have understood as they were waiting. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. And we're reading from verse 18. And therefore, will the Lord wait that she may be gracious unto you. You see that the Lord wait to be gracious unto you. It's waiting for you to recognize that Christ has come. It's waiting for you to recognize that the one that has the key of authority and the key of power, he has come. It's waiting for you to look away from the pool and look away from the water and know that the final solution has now come. And it says, therefore, will the Lord wait and that he may be gracious unto you and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment, and blessed are all they, blessed are all they, blessed are all they that do what? Wait for him. They're not waiting for the pool anymore. Blessed are all they that wait for him. We see there a pitiable uh, picture of 
helplessness and they were waiting but you know what why they were waiting they will remember that in the time of uh, elisha Naaman entered into jordan and he was completely made whole and now an angel will come once in a while and trouble the water and anybody that gets in of that much you just want will be totally healed and they were waiting for the pool waiting for the pool but the creator of the pool is now here the master of the ocean is now here. And the one that heals not with water, not with oil, not with incense, the one that heals with the power of the word of authority is now here. As you look up to him tonight, you are going to have everything he has provided in Jesus' name. And why is this demonstrated like that? To show that Jesus Christ is greater than angels. I said Jesus Christ is greater than angels. You are looking at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We are reading from verse 4. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels. You see that he came to this world. Although he was born in a manger like a baby. And then he grew in Nazareth. Like you know almost like every other person. But he had a perfect life. A spotless life. A blameless life. And a life that was irresistible and miraculously powerful. And we are told that was made better. Much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the for unto which of the angels said he at any time that what my son this day have I begotten thee and again I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son and again when he bringeth the first begotten into the world he says and let all the angels of God how many of the angels the high and the low, the great and the small, every one of them. Let all the angels of God do what? Worship him. And of the angels, he says, who maketh his angels, spirits, and his uh, ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he says, Thou thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And so you see that Christ is greater than angels, greater than prophets. That's the lesson the people should have learned. And that's why uh, when the angel come, only one person got healed every time he came. And he didn't know the time he will come again. And now Christ appeared and Christ Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever. He will walk in your life. I said he will walk in your life. I'm, I'm sure you have known about people who, before they came to hear about Christ, maybe they will see a vision of an angel. And now that, uh, you know, they were introducing Christ to them, uh, instead of listening to what is being said, and instead of looking unto Jesus Christ, the author, and the finisher of our faith, they say, I used to see angel, I used to see angel, and they're still waiting for the angel, the greater one has come. The higher one has come. The one that has great authority, all authority has now come. Look away from the angels. There are some people, before they came to hear about Jesus Christ, it was, uh, you know, God will favor them like he favored uh, Pharaoh and give a dreamer, like he favored Nebuchadnezzar and give a dreamer. That time they didn't know the word of God. They didn't know the word personified, the living word, the reaching word, the spoken word. And all they could tell was just a dream. And now we're introducing Christ to them, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now they have that. They look away from that Word. They're still looking to the dream. The time of the dream is gone. Now it is Christ, the very Son of God. He will do great things to your life in Jesus' name. There are some people before they came to know the Lord. God favored them. God, you know, just out of his mercy. If they were sick and, you know, they prayed on water and then they washed themselves with the water, one way or the other, that headache will vanish away. All those things will vanish away because Jesus had not appeared unto them. And because they didn't know Jesus at that time, the Lord had mercy on them one way or the other. It wasn't the water healing them. It wasn't the oil healing them. They were waiting for the time when the perfect will come. 
and eventually now when Christ comes and you introduce them Jesus the Alpha and the Omega the authority in our lives and the one that is a redeemer a deliverer they're still going back to the water the water will not work again because Christ is now revealed unto you and as you, re as you receive that knowledge of Christ tonight I pray that all your problems will be taken away in Jesus name we're looking at that verse 3 again and I'm looking at this under the subtitle a pertinent portrait of the hopeless a pertinent portrait of the hopeless you know why John recorded this John is saying what you see by the pool is the picture of the whole nation of Israel and it's a pitiable picture and it's a pertinent portrait of the hopeless nation look at chapter 5 verse 3 in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind halt withered waiting for the moving of the water as hopeless as these people were the whole of the nation of israel was hopeless as helpless as these people were the whole of the nation was also helpless hey, look at uh, me, um, at uh, revelation revelation chapter 3 Revelation chapter 3 and see that what we see there by the pool is what we see about this a group of people called the Laodicean church. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked i counsel thee verse 18 to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that, that and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear anoint thine eyes with eyes salve that thou mayest see you see the you see them at the pool it's a picture of the whole nation it's a picture of the whole world as we look at people to, they do not understand they're miserable they're wretched they're blind they're halting they're lame they cannot move forward somebody is halting he does not have proper feet does not have strong feet to carry him to fulfill any purpose and that's the story of everyone on earth who has not met jesus christ his sons are withered he cannot walk his feet are lame, he cannot move, and his eyes are blind, he cannot see. He cannot see things spiritual. But now Christ has come and Christ says, buy of me gold tried in the fire. And I say that you may see. And as you come to Christ tonight, all those uh, kind of limitations in your life, it will take away in Jesus' name. It is just telling us and showing us that Christ has the greater ministry and that greater ministry of christ will be affected in your life tonight in jesus name hebrews chapter 8 hebrews chapter 8 we're looking at verse 6 hebrews chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 6 in verse 6 it says but now you see the pool that's of the past the water there that's of the past it was a previous provision for the impotent multitude it's no more there now but now we have something present something real that god has made available for us that's why it says but now as he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises the new testament better promises the new covenant better promises the ministry of christ better promises and better performance that he has for us today so we're no more looking back to what is past we're looking at what the lord had given us today and we're going to enjoy them in jesus name osea chapter 13 osea chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 4 osea chapter 13 we're reading from verse 4 here the Lord is telling us in chapter 13 verse 4, it says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. The pole is not your Savior. 
The water is not your savior, and the candle is not your savior. The incense is not your savior. The garment is not your savior. That may, might have been useful in the past. It might have done something in the past. At the time of Moses, a rod divided uh, the Red Sea, but not, that's of the past. It's no more. At the time of Moses, something lifted up on the pole. They looked at that, and then they leave. That was of the past. All that past is gone. All the past provisions they are gone the, the previous provisions for the impotent multitude but now look at verse 9 in verse 9 O Israel that was destroy thyself but in me is thine help you are helpless you are hopeless your help is not in the pool anymore your help is not in whatever anymore is now in the Lord O Israel thou hast destroy thyself but tell me that in me is thine help. Say that. In God is my help. Say that. In Christ is my help. Say that. He will help you. I said he will help you. Look at verse 14. If these people had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they had looked away from the pool after he healed that single person, look at what would have happened. In verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I thought Mr. Tuck would say, Amen. I will ransom you from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plague. So grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Let's come now to point number two. Point number two, the present possibilities of, in of incredible miracles. Present possibilities. The past, forget the past. Shut the door against the past and look at the present possibilities and realities and the present provision. We're reading from verse 5 all through to verse 9. We're coming to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, reading from verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity. How many years? 30 and 8 years. I'm going to read that again. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity. How many years? 30 and 8 years. Uh, you understand? I, I told you that uh, John, uh, the beloved, was writing so that he can show Israel the picture. He said, look at this man, 30 and 8 years. He was infirm. He was impotent. And he was uh, incapacitated. He couldn't do anything at all. He so remind Israel that they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And two of those years, they came to Kadesh Barnea. And then for the rest of the 38 years, they were just like this, helpless and hopeless and roaming about in the wilderness. It's a picture of the nation. And it's a picture of everyone. And no matter the hopelessness you had before, before you came here tonight, hope has come. Yeah. No matter the helplessness you had before you came here tonight, help has come. Yeah. Because the help is in Christ and the hope is in Christ. And everything that brought sorrow and tears to your eyes, everything will be wiped away in Jesus' name. Yeah. Look, at, look at verse 30, verse 6. It says, when Jesus saw him lie, that is lying there, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He says unto him, wilt thou be made whole tonight? Wilt thou be made whole? Yeah. Wilt thou be saved? Yeah. Wilt thou be healed? Yeah. Wilt thou be delivered? Yeah. Can God solve your problem? Yeah. Can Jesus remove your mountain? Yeah. He will. I said you will. Look at verse 7. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step is in down before me. Jesus saith unto him. Jesus saith unto him. This is final authority. This is mighty power. This is irresistible power. There's nobody like Jesus. There's no power like the power of Jesus. 
There's no love like the love of Jesus. There's no miracle like the miracles of Jesus. And there's no helper like Jesus Christ, your helper. He loves you. He has mercy upon you. And he's going to roll your problems away in Jesus' name. Jesus says unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And tell me the next word in verse 9. Tell me, tell me, tell me. And immediately, do you know that all those things have been coming about for many years? Immediately, that thing can vanish away. All the tears, immediately, the Lord can wipe everything away. All the sadness and the sorrow, you're moody, you're never happy. And it's like you're carrying a load at your back. Immediately tonight, Jesus comes to you. And then happiness and joy will come in Jesus' name. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Those verses I read to you now. Look at this. Number one, a great question from the Almighty. A great question from the Almighty. Number two, a gloomy answer by the afflicted. A gloomy answer by the afflicted. Number three, the glorious authority of Christ, the anointed. The glorious authority of Christ, the anointed. Number four, the grievous attachment to the abolished. The grievous attachment to the abolished. Let's come to number one. A great answer from a great question from the Almighty. Look at verse 5. Verse 6. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had, been, he had been now a long time. In that case, he says unto him, tell me. He says unto me, shout it out. Wilt thou be made whole? You see, you must understand the authority of the person asking the question. You must understand the status of the person asking the question. If a little child came to ask you, will thou be made whole? Maybe you don't need to answer. And if somebody, an illiterate, somebody who does not know anything, cannot do anything, comes to ask you, will thou be made whole? He doesn't even know what is happening to you. But when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when the Master of Ocean and Sky and Sea, and when the, the, the author of our faith and the author of everything good comes to ask you and he says will thou be made whole the almighty is asking you a question he wants to solve your problem and he's going to solve your problem in jesus name some people are surprised who are saying that this is a great question a great question from the almighty they say are you referring to jesus christ who asked the question as the almighty let the bible answer we're looking at revelation chapter one revelation chapter one I'm reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Are you there? I am Alpha and Omega. Who is talking? I am Alpha and Omega. I said who is talking? The beginning and the ending. Who is that? Says the Lord. Look at this. Which is, which was, and which is to come. That is, he was, he is, and he is to come. Who is the one that is coming again? And then look at the latter, look at the last uh, word in that uh, verse 8, the Almighty, the Almighty. The Almighty is asking a question tonight, he says, will thou be made whole? You will be made whole. Will you be saved? You will be saved. Will your mountain go away? Your mountain will go away. That's the Almighty. That's the Almighty. Look at, look at Matthew. Matthew, I'm reading from chapter 28. This is the Almighty. We're looking at chapter 28 of Matthew. I'm reading from verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He's here tonight. He declares to you tonight. He says he has all might. He has all strength. He has all power. And he has all the supernatural in his control. And when he speaks to your problem tonight, praise the Lord. Your problems are solved in Jesus' name.
Now, look at the answer of the man. I'm coming to John chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 7. The gloomy answer by the afflicted. We're looking at chapter 5, verse 7 of John. It says, the important man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step it down before me. And that's the answer he gave. And that's the answer of everyone that has not known Christ. And because at this time, he didn't know Christ. And yet he had a problem. And the pool that he was uh, depending upon, uh, that pool was not helping him because uh, somebody steps in uh, before him. He's always missing it. Always missing it. Maybe you have always been missing it, but tonight you will not miss it. You know, uh, before I get that job, somebody else has got the job. Before I get uh, that marriage uh, settled, another person has uh, got the hand of that uh, lady. And before I got that land, another person has got that land. And before I got uh, that connection, another person has got the connection. I'm always missing it. Thank God you are here tonight. Your time of blessing has come. Your time of breakthrough has come. Your salvation has come. Your deliverance has come. If you have been missing it before tonight, you will not miss it. In Job chapter, Job chapter 13, Job chapter 19, rather, Job chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 13. Just what that man said, I have no man while I'm coming. Another person gets there before me. In Job chapter 19, verse 13, he has put my brethren far from me. My acquaintance are very least estranged from me. And my kinsfolk have failed, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. They that dwell in my house and my maze count me for a stranger. I am an alien uh, in their sight. Look at verse 19. All my inward friends abhorred me, and they whom I loved turned against me. That's what that man was saying. I've been here now for a long time. 38 years have passed and yet I am not having any helper. I'm not having anybody to help me and put me into the pool. And Job said, all the people have abandoned me. I cannot see anybody to help me or to encourage me or to give me hope. All of a sudden, he realized that Jesus is near. And I'm say, looking at you tonight. All of a sudden, somebody is near you there. I said, somebody is near you there. Tell me his name. It's your healer. It's your savior. It's your redeemer. All of a sudden, Job realized, look at verse 24, it's 25, for I know that my redeemer liveth. And he, shall, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Upon the earth. Here is the earth. Jesus is here today. I said, Jesus is here today. I'm looking at Psalm 69. Psalm 69. You're not the only person that has felt abandoned and felt dejected and felt hopeless and felt helpless as if there's no man, as if there's no friend, as if there's no helper. You're not the only one. Other people have felt like that before, but Jesus came to their help. And no matter how you feel today, I don't have anybody, no sympathizer, nobody. And they just look at, I'm abandoned, but tonight you are not abandoned. It's Psalm 69, we're looking at verse 20. Psalm 69, verse 20, reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. And I look for some to take, to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but... I found none. That's what that man was saying. And yet, help came. And whatever it is you are saying, help has come. My help has come. My hope has come. I will not die like a, like a fowl. And I will not commit suicide. Because a better time has come for me. A better time has come for you in Jesus' name. Uh, uh, Psalm 142, Psalm 142, I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 142, verse 4. It says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but 
there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. No man cared for my soul. That's what that man was saying. I have no man when the angel comes and he troubles the water and then somebody goes there before me and the time of miracle is gone and I never get anything. Today you are getting something. Now, number one is the great question from the Almighty. Number two is the gloomy answer by the afflicted. Number three, the glorious authority of Christ, the anointed. The glorious authority of Christ, the anointed. We're coming to chapter 5 of John. John chapter 5, and I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Somebody there, did you hear? I said, somebody there, who is this one speaking to? Jesus says unto you, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately, instantaneously, instantly, without wasting time, the man was made whole. 38 years of problem went away. 38 years of burden went away. 38 years of crying went away. Instantaneously. Thank God. I see you there tonight. And the Lord is going to answer your prayer tonight. Immediately the man was made whole and he took up his bed and walked. That's his authority. He has not changed. Jesus Christ the same. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. We're looking at Matthew chapter 8 verse 8. Matthew chapter 8 verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but, but speak the word only. The pool is not necessary anymore. The water is not necessary anymore. Oil not necessary anymore. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way. Go home tonight with joy. Go thy way. Go home tonight with your healing. Go thy way. Go home tonight with salvation. Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be done unto thee. And the servant was healed in the self same hour. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. And when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. No oil with his word. No water with his word. No pool with his word. No rod with his word. No bell with his word. He cast out the spirit with his word and healed how many? All that were sick. We're coming to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 40. Mark chapter 1. Reading from verse 40. In Mark chapter 1 verse 40, it says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, pleading with him, praying to him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, and saith unto him, I say, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, and as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. He was cleansed. That anointing is here tonight. Because Jesus Christ is here in a mighty anointing. Luke chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 18. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Here is the glorious authority of Christ. The anointed. In Luke chapter 4 verse 18. And the spirit of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach, to proclaim, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book 
and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fasting on the pool on the water on the candle on the oil on him fasting on him and he began to say unto them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears give me a good amen, amen. verse 32 verse 32 and they were astonished at his doctrine for his word was with power his word was with power Number one, a great question. Number two, a gloomy answer. Number three, a glorious authority. Number four, a grievous attachment to the abolished. Grievous attachment to the abolished. We're coming to John chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 9. John chapter 5, we're reading from verse 9. And immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Verse 10, and the Jews therefore said unto him that was killed, it is, it is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful, not right for thee to carry thy bed. You know what happened here? There were many people there, multitudes of people, of those who are lame, those who are paralyzed, those who have stroke, those who are blind, those who are deaf, and those who are halting, and those who are withered hands, they, a lot of problems. And they saw the miracle on this man, and Jesus was still there. He performed the miracle, and none of the other people looked at Jesus. None of the other people came to Jesus to say, do it for me too. I've been here for a long time. Do it for me too. I'm helpless. Do it for me too. I am hopeless. You know why? Because they were looking at the pool. They didn't want to miss. An angel might come now and trouble the water and I'll miss my chance. And the other time I was, able, I was about to get in and then somebody got in before me. And Jesus could have healed all of them. If they had asked him, all those important people, but they didn't ask, they saw, they heard, the miracle was done in their very presence. And yet, because their eyes kept looking at the pool, their eyes would not look at the Prince of Peace, at the power of God, at the Lord Jesus Christ, the mountain mover, and at the Lord Jesus Christ, our deliverer, our savior. Their eyes were on the pool, their eyes were on the path. Their minds were attached to the old order. They were blinded by religion and they were chained by the Sabbath law. Because they said, it's on the Sabbath day, I won't allow anything to happen to me today because, uh, you know, the Pharisees will say, why are you carrying your bed? Why are you walking? Why are you going? Why are you moving? Because it is the Sabbath day. The grievous attachment to the abolished. And you know, this old uh, covenant they were thinking about, that, uh, glued, that they glued their eyes on or their minds on, those things have been, the thing have been abolished. And yet, they will not look away from that which was abolished and look at Jesus Christ that has now come to be a final savior. We're coming to Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 13. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. To the end of that which is abolished. They didn't understand that old covenant was abolished, the pool was abolished. The angels will not come there anymore now. The final word, the final solution, the final answer had come from heaven. And as the Lord Jesus Christ, they were to look away from the past and look at the present provision of the Lord. Look at verse 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil on taking away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Which veil is done away in Christ. And let's come back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, I'm reading verse 40. John chapter 5, we're reading from verse 40. And ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. 
You're so glued to the old and ye will not come. You're so, so focused on the old covenant and ye will not come. And you're so attached to that which has been abolished already and ye will not come unto me. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 15. Matthew chapter 13. We're reading from verse 15. It says, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, what did they do? They have closed. They closed their eyes to Christ, and they closed their eyes to the present help. They closed their eyes to the present ministry. They closed their eyes because the only thing they would look at was the pool. The only thing they would look at was that which had been abolished, the old covenant. It says the eyes they have closed, lest at any time uh, they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. As you look at Christ tonight, it will save you. As you look at Christ tonight, he will heal your body. He will deliver you from every oppression and attack in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now. Is persevering pursuit of the imperative mandate. Is persevering pursuit of the imperative mandate. We come to John chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was killed, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he, he answered them, He that made me whole, Jesus will make you whole. He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that? Which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk. And he was, uh, and he that was healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Verse 14, afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Behold, thou art made whole. I said, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst sin come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus that had made him whole. And therefore, the, the Jews persecuted who? Jesus and, and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Persevering pursuit. Of the imperative mandate. Look at number one here. This section. Protecting the Sabbath above their souls. Protecting the Sabbath above their souls. Look at verse 10 again. The Jews therefore said unto him that was killed. It is not. It is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. They had lost consciousness of the importance of their soul. They had lost consciousness of the importance of salvation. They lost consciousness of the importance of the truth of the word of God, of help coming from above. They saw the man who had been paralyzed, the man who had been impotent, the man who had been a kind of a useless to himself for 38 years. And the help came, and the deliverance came, and the healing came, and spiritual life came to him. They didn't bother about the spiritual life, about the healing. All they were concerned about was the Sabbath. They exalted Sabbath about salvation. They exalted tradition above the truth. They exalted religion above redemption. They exalted their dignity above their destiny. They, they exalted self above the Savior. And because of that, they were blindfolded. There are many people like that today. They have another thing they are concentrating on. They have another thing they appreciate. They have another thing they are exalting above their soul, above their salvation, above the doctrines of the Bible, above the truth of the Word of God, above our redemption, and above the Savior. And the Lord is saying that we should not be blind like those 
Pharisees, you will not be blind in Jesus' name. Because uh, the Lord told them, look at Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 9. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 9. Here was uh, the thing that hindered them from the truth and from salvation and from redemption and from eternal life. In Mark chapter 7 verse 9, it says, And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. You reject salvation, you reject holiness, you reject righteousness, and you reject destiny, you reject heaven, so that you can keep your tradition. Look at verse 13, making void, the, uh, making, vo making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye are believing and many such things, many such like things ye do. They allow tradition to cancel the truth of the word of God in their lives. I pray that will not happen to you in Jesus' name. Number two, preserving the saved from sinning. Preserving the saved from sinning. We're coming to John chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 14. John chapter 5 verse 14 After what Jesus findeth him in the temple He did not find him in a shrine He did not find him in an idol temple He did not find him in a dancing hall He had received a transformation and change from the Lord And the man 38 years he has been lying down helpless And after 38 years he got up Because a miracle came to him And where did he go? He went to the temple He went to worship the Lord. He said, I missed all this for 38 years when I was impotent and when I was helpless, when I was hopeless and when I was uh, totally incapacitated. But now I get up and I'm going to show glory to God afterward. Jesus minded him. Tell me where? In the temple. And said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Behold, thou art made, made whole. See no more. Somebody shout, see no more. Shout it out loud. Finally, see no more, lest the worst thing come on thee. Isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ was saying that now you are saved, not only that you are healed, you are made whole in your body, you are made whole in your spirit, you are made whole in your mind, you are redeemed, you are saved, you are forgiven. Things are totally different now. The grace of God is now in you, but now sin no more. Preserving the saved from sinning. Let's come to John chapter 8 verse 11. Preserving the saved from sinning. John chapter 8 verse 11. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Tell me the rest go and sin no more, preserving the saved from sinning. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, now you are saved, now you are born again, now you say you are a child of God, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey each in the lost thereof. Look at verse 22, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, preserving the saved from sinning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and sin not. 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, these things write down to you that you say not. These things write down to you that you say not. And if any man sin, even before you came here today, you didn't know this truth, and you have seen, we have an advocate for the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He'll make you righteous in Jesus' name. 
chapter 3, chapter 3, first John, chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Look at verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Amen. Amen. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. God. Chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. You see that? It says, You have been made whole, but sin no more, lest the worst thing happen unto you. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. He will not touch you. I said, He will not touch you. In this section, John chapter 5. Now, John chapter 5, we're looking at it now from verse 15 and verse 16. Number one, protecting the Sabbath above their souls. Number two, preserving the saved from sinning. Number three, persecuting the Savior for his service. Persecuting the Savior for his service. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Therefore, think about this, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. The Jews persecute Jesus. The Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath Day. Can you think of uh, something so terrible as this? Number one, this is the sinner persecuting the Savior. The sinners, the Jews, persecuting the Savior. Number two, these are creatures persecuting the Creator. He created them. The world was made by Him. Everyone in the world made by him, the creatures persecuting the creator. Here is the poor persecuting the provider. He came to provide life. He came to provide healing. He came to provide blessing. And the poor helpless people, the Jews, the poor persecuting the provider. These were slaves. And these were slaves persecuting the only begotten son of God. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The son of God came and he gave them life and he gave them salvation and he gave them redemption and he gave them blessings untold and blessings that nobody else had ever given them. And these slaves, they were persecuting the son. Number five, reprobates persecuting the redeemer. He came with redemption and he came to with blessing from heaven. And these were reprobates. These were people, if they continued in that, they were going to end up in hellfire. And you think about these reprobates persecuting the redeemer. Here are the hopeless people, the hopeless persecuting their only hope. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world and the hope of everyone and here were hopeless people that had nothing and Jesus could have got them into life eternal the hopeless persecuting their only hope here the helpless were persecuting their heavenly helper instead of coming to him appealing to him beseeching him and praying to him saying we need that help that divine help that heavenly help but the helpless persecuted the heavenly helper jesus christ is our advocate and is the final judge on the final day these accused people these guilty people they accused persecuting 
the advocate and it is she knows the world is upside down and sometimes it is still like that today the people that will get them saved the people that will get them healed the people that will get them delivered they were persecuting him look at verse 16 there therefore did the jews persecute jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the sabbath and uh, look at chapter 15 of john John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 20. John chapter 15, reading from verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, look at that. They have persecuted me, Christ. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sin, they will also they will keep yours also. And let's look at verse 23. Verse 23 of that same John 15. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a reason, without a cause. Chapter 10, John chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 31. John chapter 10, reading from verse 31. In verse 31, it says, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Savior being persecuted by sinners and for his service. You will not be a persecutor. You will not persecute your helper. You will not persecute your only hope. And your heavenly help you will not persecute in Jesus' name. They did not believe, but thank God I believe. I say, thank God I believe. Somebody there, I believe. I believe. And good things will happen to you in Jesus' name. And then let's come now to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 5. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time, in that case, he says unto him, Will thou be made whole? Somebody there tonight, will thou be made whole? Yes. Will you be forgiven? Yes. Will you be saved? Yes. Will you be healed? Yes. Will you be delivered? Yes. Will your mountain roll away today? Yes. Will thou be made whole? The important man answered, Sir, I have no man, but thank God I have Jesus. I have no man, thank God I have his promises. I have no man, thank God I have the prophecy. I have no man, but thank God I have the miracle working power. Thank God I have the name. He has given us his name. And whatsoever ye shall ask in that name, it shall be given to you in Jesus' name. And Jesus saith unto him, something is coming your way. And Jesus saith unto him, I said something is coming your way. Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately, when is your salvation? When is your forgiveness? What is your miracle? What is your healing? And immediately the man was made whole and he took up his bed and he walked and on the, on the same day was the Sabbath day. On the same day was our study day. Our study day tonight, miracle. Our study day tonight, a salvation. Our study day to, tonight, there's going to be mountain moving away in Jesus' name. Are you there? Rise up now. Are you there? Rise up and tell the Lord. Rise up and tell the Lord. He'll make you whole. He'll make you whole. It's the healing of the impotent. It's the salvation for the sinner. It's the deliverance for the oppressed. And for the people that are under any yoke. Because Jesus Christ is asking you tonight. Wilt thou be made whole? 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 He loves you. He loves you. And he does not want you to continue in any suffering, in any attack, in any affliction. Because Jesus Christ.
Christ, our deliverer, our savior, our helper, our hope is here tonight. Call on him. He wants to save you. He will forgive your sin. He will change your life. He will give you life eternal. Wilt thou be made whole? Wilt thou be made whole? Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's all he has come. Look away from the pool. Look away from the old covenant. That thing has been abolished. That thing has been cancelled. That thing has been cast aside. But Jesus Christ is now your Savior. Jesus Christ is now your Savior. Call upon him. Call upon him. Call upon him. Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That man was not expecting anything like that that day. It came suddenly. Maybe you were not expecting salvation. But it's coming suddenly upon you tonight. It's coming suddenly upon you tonight. And then as you are saved, as he forgives you, as he changes your life, as he transforms your life, he finds you not in the dancing hall anymore, not in the shrine anymore, not at the riverside anymore, not, in, not at the false prophet shrine or tent anymore. But now he finds you with the children of God, people of God in the temple. And he says to you, Behold, thou art made whole. Behold, thou art made whole. Behold, thou art made whole. See no more. See no more. See no more. Lest the worst thing come on thee. He gives you, he gives you the grace to go and see no more. He gives you the power to go and see no more. He gives you the divine ability to go and see no more. He lives on the inside of you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Salvation. Righteousness. Holiness. Redemption. Deliverance. Transformation. Heavenly life in you is there. Life has come. Eternal life has come. Resurrection life has come. Resurrection power has come. Receive him. He rejects no one. Receive him. He will not push you away. Receive him. The salvation is available for you. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God and the blessed people tonight, I said, in Jesus' name we pray. It's about a nice close. Do you know that all the sins you ever committed in your life until this point, Jesus the Savior has now come. He will forgive you in a single sentence. Your name will be written in the book of life in heaven. New life will come into you. And the grace to go and sin no more, he'll give to you tonight. Let's bow the nice close. you want that experience of salvation, that forgiveness, that eternal life. Wherever you are, inside, outside, anywhere you are hearing, you are at the Bible study now, anywhere you are, raise up that hand, salvation is coming. Redemption is coming. Raise up that. Raise it up very well. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. As you raise up that, just tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm a sinner. You're my Savior. I receive you. I believe you. I accept you. I will not reject the offer of your salvation. Thank you, Jesus. I believe. My sins are forgiven. I believe I am saved. I believe Jesus is my Savior. I believe I have the grace of God now. My life is changed. My life is changed. Everybody, let's say that together. My life is changed. 
keep on that. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your love and for your mercy and for your grace. And you have said that, Lord, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I bring all these uh, new brothers and sisters, young and old, before you. I pray, Lord, forgive their sins in Jesus' name. Let the assurance from the Holy Ghost come in their hearts right now. Their sins are forgiven. The sins are taken away. Lord, we thank you for that salvation. The grace to go and live in newness of life. Give to everyone in Jesus' name. Both them and all the old uh, uh, timers, all the people who have been children of God, even before this time, new strength, new power, new divine ability. Satan will not overcome any of us anymore in Jesus' name. Confirm your salvation in everyone. In Jesus' name I pray. First I can give a greater amen. Now, long-standing problem will vanish away. Long-standing mountain will vanish away. 38 years of infirmity, tonight it will go. 38 years of problems, today it will go. Impotence will vanish away. Oppression will vanish away. Affliction will vanish away. Those tears, the Lord will dry up everything. Joy. Joy. Laughter. Deliverance. Redemption. Healing. Any partaker there? It's on you according to your faith. I said any partaker there? Tonight is that night. Study night. It happens said Sabbath day over there. But over here, study night. Supernatural night. Night of supply. Night of sufficiency. That mountain is moving. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray for every one of your people here. Lord, you have asked us the question, will thou be made whole? Yes, Lord, we want to be made whole. And we know that with you, nothing shall be impossible. I bring every brother, every sister, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl before you now. Do the impossible in Jesus' name. Wipe those tears away. Take that pain away. Take that disease away mountain i command you come out in jesus name oppression i command you come out in jesus name all those attacks and all those things walking about in the body come out in jesus name those blind eyes lord i pray you touch those blind eyes right now open their dim and blind eyes in jesus name those deaf ears and dumb tongues open them and lose them in jesus name the attack and the affliction and the bondage, all the chains will be broken right now. Insanity, get away in Jesus' name. Asthma, get away in Jesus' name. Cancer, you don't have chance to remain there. That cancer will dry up. Cancer, I command you, be healed in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for every single person here without exception. Everyone inside, everyone outside, everyone, everyone here, Lord. Lord, I pray that the miracle will happen to everyone in Jesus' name. Confirm it right now. Immediately. 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 That man rose up and he took up his bed and he walked. And that's a miracle that happens instantaneously to come upon everyone right now. And Lord, the joy of the Lord will never end in their heart. Every day it will increase. Every week it will increase. Testimony in every mouth. Joy in every life. Strength in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the confirmation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. evermore amen surely god's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives 
and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Say to your neighbor, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer Thank <laughs> you.